we get lots of cases with these woke corporations who are calling people in to the diversity, equity, inclusion office. They're saying you have to use these pronouns. You have to, and there's people of faith that say, I can't do this. You're asking me to sign something I don't believe in, or you're asking me to say something that I know is not true. And it puts them in a, in a real difficulty and they're getting crushed. I mean, we're seeing them get fired. We have those cases. Well, they all now have all this protection that they didn't have. Welcome back to the Rosenberg Report as I continue my fascinating conversation with Kelly Shackelford. He's the head of First Liberty and one of the foremost evangelical experts on the Supreme Court, on legal reform, and the defense of religious freedom. We sat down in Park City, Utah, amidst a conference that Kelly organized that included a former Attorney General of the United States, a former Secretary of Education, a former Commander of the Elite Delta Force, and some of the litigators who have argued and won, mind you, some of the biggest landmark cases at the Supreme Court in recent years. What we saw in the NFL with the Buffalo Bills game when a player dropped dead on the field, and there hasn't been prayer in the NFL on the field in decades. But all those players immediately started praying, grouping together. People on ESPN and television started praying and talking out loud about all these aspects. I'm convinced this would have never happened if it hadn't been for Coach Kennedy winning his case. And then if you, if you watched in the fall, all across America at high schools, after games, players, coaches were all coming together to pray. That started to become viral, and it led to this guy's life being saved. People prayed, he came back to life. And, and I think that's what we would see in dramatic ways in restoring faith with America, uh, in America by just if people start doing things other people see, and it, it would educate people much more quickly. And I, you know, who knows, but if this really happened like I think it will, I mean, this could be the spark that starts revival in America because people will start restoring faith in their communities. Let's talk about another case uh, briefly. Uh, I think it's called 303 Creative. Um, why don't you describe what the case was and how, you know, how dramatically it, it went. 303 Creative is a case with a, a web designer who wanted to do uh, uh, webs for, including for, for weddings, and, but they're in Colorado. And Colorado has this history of going after wedding vendors if they will do uh, if they won't do same-sex marriages, but they do you know regular marriages. And so this web designer uh, said, you know, I've I've got to have protection. So she filed a lawsuit before anything ever happened to say I've got to know that I'm not going to get you know fined and shut down and everything else. And it went through the system and all the way to the Supreme Court. Meaning she was losing. She was along losing. Along the way, you will be penalized. You if will you, be penalized. If you will do your creativity for one side, or you know, for traditional biblical marriage and not for a That's same right. sex. That's right. And the arguments that she was making, and we have cases just like this, other cases at First Liberty, but this violates free speech. The government is trying to force her to say something she doesn't want to say. And if she won't, they're going to punish her. It violates free exercise of religion. It violates her conscience and faith to do this, and they're trying to force her to do that. Well, when it went up to the Supreme Court, they only took one of the two claims. They didn't take the religious freedom claim. They took the free speech claim. And in that decision, which should have been 9-0, in my opinion, but 6-3, they said, this violates free speech. We can't have the government telling citizens, if you don't say certain things, we're gonna punish you. And so it was a great victory, I think, for free speech. It'll go beyond even, you know, obviously, wedding vendors. It'll be across the board. But it does leave open the whole religious freedom aspect um, because there's a lot of things that are the free exercise of religion that aren't speech, you know, they're, they're activity. Uh, and so uh, that issue is sort of left on the table for the future and we'll end up having that, but it's a, it's a big victory for free speech and the idea of forcing people to sort of participate in saying things. And I, I've been in plenty of debates on this and you know people get really upset. And, I, and what usually works is I try to help them see the shoe on the other foot. And I say, do you really think the government should have the power to punish a black baker 
because he won't bake a cake for the Klan rally. And at that point, they realize, you know, I, no, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't force that. Right. And that's, I mean, it's basic. In this country, the right of people to believe what they believe and not have the government force them to do things that violate their faith should be obvious, but we're still waiting for that case. Uh, just handed down, I mean, just, you know, very fresh, a fresh ink, uh, is Groff versus United States Postal Service. And we represent Gerald Groff, who's a, a wonderful man who came off the mission field and wanted to work a place where he didn't have to violate his Sabbath, which is Sunday. And he went to the Postal Service. Great place. And all of a sudden, they started having Amazon deliver packages on Sunday. And all of a sudden, he was, he was told he needed to work on Sunday. Well, there's federal law to protect religious freedom in the workplace, and he asked for an accommodation. Well, easy for them to accommodate. There's 600,000 employees at the Postal Service. All they have to do is switch a schedule, but they didn't. And they pushed him out. And he brought a lawsuit, and we went all the way to the Supreme Court. And most people go, oh, yeah, okay, it's just a little Sabbath case. No, this is about whether people get religious freedom in the workplace, because it really is about the standard. The law was real clear when it was passed that we really treasure religious freedom. So we want employers to accommodate the religious beliefs of their employers, if they can do so without harming their business in a significant way. And the larger the business, the easier it is to accommodate. If you have 10 people or something, that's you, may, right. you know, one employee, that could be a significant exactly. thing. Exactly, so. exactly. So that's why they did a, 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 a standard that was, you know, you have to look at the, the cost or, the, or the, the, you know, the harm to the business as a whole. But easy to switch schedules if you're the Postal Service. But what happened is 46 years ago, the Supreme Court was the same Supreme Court that had this lemon, this separation of church and state, where they thought the government can never do anything that might be helpful to religion. This is their approach. So they essentially gutted this statute and rewrote it to make words mean things that they didn't mean. It was very dishonest. But the result was people had very little protection in the workplace. Well, in this case, we we're at the Supreme Court and we, we showed them this is not what these words mean. And they were like, you're right. And nine to zero, they said. Nine zero. Nine zero. They said, this is not the right standard. There's now this level of protection for everybody in the workplace. And it's not just government entities. It's this statute applies to private employers or government employers. So people aren't thinking about this. We get lots of cases with these woke corporations who are calling people into the diversity, equity, inclusion office. They're saying, you have to use these pronouns. You have to, and there's people of faith that say, I can't do this. You're asking me to sign something I don't believe in, or you're asking me to say something that I know is not true. And it puts them in a, in a real difficulty, and they're getting crushed. I mean, we're seeing them get fired. We have those cases. Well, they all now have all this protection that they didn't have. But they may still have to litigate. They might. Uh, they'll or at be least, for a while. Or at least have legal representation to push back and say, Listen, you guys don't understand there's there's a clarified right. uh, standard now. What I loved about the summit that Kelly hosted and what I loved about my conversation with Kelly was the opportunity to better understand some of the positive, some of the encouraging fruit that has been born as a result of major political battles over the Supreme Court and legal reforms here in the United States in, in recent years, recent decades. You know as well as I do how hard and painful it was to get traditional-minded, conservative, uh, God-fearing, strict constructionists like Clarence Thomas and Samuel Alito on the high court. Those were not easy battles. And you also know the apocalyptic battles that ensued to get Brett Kavanaugh and Amy Comey Barrett and others on the high court as well. And now we're seeing the fruit of winning those battles, not just winning the presidency and control of the Senate, but what, how important it is to win both of those if you're trying to appoint justices who see the world the way you do and want to uh, uh, make decisions in critically important cases based on the Constitution, not just making things up uh, off the top of their head. We've seen terrible decisions, therefore, like Roe v. Wade overturned uh, in the past year. And finally, we're seeing huge victories in cases involving religious liberty, personal freedom, and the rule of law. Now, the war over legal reform isn't over. 
in the States. Far from it, right? And the 2024 campaign is going to, you know, this will be a big part of it about uh, how, you know, who will appoint the next justices to the court. Will Biden and his team try to expand the court? But we need to recognize and celebrate these victories. And so that, that was one of the joys of coming back home to the United States this summer and, and getting to spend time with the people that have argued and won these cases. At the same time, we need to pray that Israel gets its war over legal reform right. Uh, the political battles back in Israel are brutal right now because both sides see that the stakes are so high and neither side has any desire to compromise. But I don't want you to be discouraged. Let's keep, let's just keep praying that God will grant his wisdom and mercy to Israel's leaders. Uh, that like the sons of Issachar in the Bible, they may understand, they may truly understand the times that they live in and know what Israel must do.